Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. So today we have uh, among us Ajay Shukla. Uh, Ajay Shukla is an Indian journalist and a retired colonel of the Indian Army. Uh, he writes article on defense policies, uh, production, acquisition. Currently works as a consulting editor with Business Standard. And uh, he's a person who is probably responsible for all our nightmares regarding the Chinese intrusions over the last few months we have seen. And thank you so much, sir, actually, for bringing the story out there for the public. Because if you weren't, if it was important for people like you, the story probably would have been uh, been down under the other incidents that even are happening around the country. So thank you so much, sir, for bringing the story, and thank you so much, sir, for speaking to us tonight, sir. Very, you're very welcome, Ratna. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, it's a happy nightmare, we can say, rather, because we have journalists like you who are bringing out the truth. So thank you so much again. And Shitan, start with the first question. Uh, thank you, Ratnadeep. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Colonel Shukla, for joining us. So uh, you were the first person who broke the story out in the public domain about the whole indo sino conflict uh, that was taking place in the eastern frontier with, our, uh, with China. So, first of all, how do you land up to this story? Because you were someone who cleared a lot of misconceptions and you have been constantly saying that it is a big conflict, it is going to be a large-scale conflict, you have been continuously pushing uh, the people uh, to clear the misconceptions. So, how do you land up to this story particularly? Uh, well, uh, you know, without uh, actually revealing my sources, uh, I, would, I would only say that uh, uh, first of all, the, the outlines of the story were reported by other people even as early as the end of April. Uh, but I don't think uh, they, were, uh, they were sort of uh, aware or they were ready to report the extent to which the Chinese had been moved into Indian territory, uh, the amount of territory they had uh, occupied, the aggressiveness and the intent with which they were doing it, these were things that were not clear at that initial phase of reporting. Uh, but then, uh, you know, then I started talking to my sources over there. Uh, and it's important to know that while reporting a story like this, you know, uh, which is basically located in an uninhabited place where the army is in full control of the narrative and every uh, sort of bit of access that journalists have in that area and so on, you need to have a range of sources and very good sources at that. And when you're reporting a story as serious as this, as an incursion by Chinese uh, troops on multiple fronts into Indian territory, you have to be very, very sure of your facts. So uh, it took me also a little while to check, cross-check, double-check, uh, make sure that I was not overstating the case, uh, and only then did I actually uh, go out and uh, publish my report. But once uh, I started, uh, then there were many people who were willing to give information because this was a matter of concern for a large number of people on the ground. And then the story just gathered its own momentum. Yeah. Okay, sir. So, uh, as we speak as well, uh, we have seen there has been a repeated intrusion over the past. Uh, we have seen intrusions in the last few days before as well. And uh, what? why is this uh, the conflict that's happening or this intrusion of the Chinese uh, army or the PLA is very different from the previous intrusion because we have seen intrusion in the past as well. And this has been a regular border incidence. We have seen that uh, both the army patrols and sometimes they cross over and they've been asked to move back and they have. But why is this intuition so important? Because we have seen a lot of people have mentioned as well that uh, this border has been slowly moved from what it used to exist over the period of time. But why is this one so important? 
Oh, well, uh, there are several reasons that set this particular set of inclusions apart from what we have been seeing in the past. Uh, first of all, uh, it is the scale on which the Chinese have come in. This is not uh, the an odd patrol or a sort of a company of 60 people coming in and setting up a couple of tents on Indian territory. These are hundreds, perhaps thousands of Chinese soldiers uh, intruding into Indian territory, establishing themselves, uh, and then staying there. The second major difference from past inclusions is that this happened simultaneously at many different points, uh, ranging from Dalat Sikh Oldi sector in northern Ladakh, the northern tip of India actually, all the way to the Sikkim sector, which means that this uh, particular set of inclusions was of organized, orchestrated and sanctioned at the highest level of the PLA, the People's Liberation Army of China. Uh, the third big difference was the degree of uh, aggression with which the Chinese came in. The way they beat up Indian soldiers in, uh, in uh, the Pangong sector, the killing of 20 Indian soldiers in Galwan. This is clearly something that was of a different order of magnitude. Uh, and then finally, the other big difference was that this was happening at a very, very sort of sensitive and difficult time for India, which was grappling with COVID, which was uh, sort of grappling with the situation on the ground in Kashmir. So all these factors actually go to make this a very different set of inclusion, both in spread, in geographical spread, in order of magnitude, and in the seriousness and intent with which the PLA has come. And they are still sitting there. This is not an inclusion like in the past ones where they pack up and leave after some time. This time it seems that for now that they are here to stay. So once again, uh, the whole LEC conflict is uh, in the news again. So what are the recent updates uh, you are picking up uh, on that particular front? And the Indian Army fought in an attempt of the Chinese troops to carry out a provocative uh, military movement to change the status quo in the southern bank of Pangong so Lake in Ladakh. This incident at the LSE took place overnight between August 29th and August 30th. So what are the recent uh, developments, particularly from the, which is different, is it different from the previous conflict that we, saw, we were facing a couple of months back? And what do we make out of this behavior, of this regular engagement from the Chinese? You're talking about how the uh, the recent incidents on the south flank of the Pangongso are different from <coughs> earlier incidents uh, in the May-June uh, period. Is that your question? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think this is substantially different from what has been happening. Uh, since the Chinese entered at the beginning of May, uh, they have been doing more or less the same thing, which is capturing tactically important key patches of territory uh, so that uh, they are effectively shifting the line of actual control to the west, that is deeper into India, and gaining control of territory that is uh, good for defending their uh, sort of sectors that they've captured, so that the Indians, if they, are, if they sort of choose to use force and choose to attack the Chinese, they'll find the Chinese sitting in sort of tactical height. Now that was the aim of this recent, this most recent thing at the end of August when they came and tried to capture two tactical uh, heights and beyond that also, uh, which was Black Top and Helmet Top on the south bank of the Pangong. So Lake. Uh, they tried to extend their sort of hold towards even further close towards India. Uh, to sort of extend their hold over this particular patch of territory so that it would become easier to defend for them. But overall, it is part of the same game plan, which is to capture tactically important heights and move the LAC westward. So, uh, as we are speaking, sir, uh, with, the, with a rough estimate, uh, how many Chinese soldiers are there in Indian soil? And as we speak, there are, in my estimation, about 4,000 to 5,000 Chinese soldiers on what India regards as its own side of the line of actual control. Uh, and in addition to that, there's a build-up, a very heavy build-up, 
of at least 30 to 40,000 Chinese soldiers just on their side of the line of actual control uh, so that they are ready to reinforce any positions that the Indians might choose to attack or try to clear. So all in all, it's a very, very heavy deployment by the Chinese. In addition to these large numbers of soldiers, there are tanks, there are artillery guns, there are air defense batteries, there are uh, logistic echelons. Uh, they're all prepared to stay and fight. Uh, and it also has to be said that the Indians have not been idle during this particular uh, sort of interlude. We have also built up troops uh, on, the, on the border. So now you have a situation where you have two very, very uh, sort of heavily armed and very well-equipped armies facing each other on a disputed line of actual control. And that's an extremely dangerous situation to be in. So, sir, China intruded uh, in the Indian territory in Eastern Ladakh in early May, and uh, that you have pointed that out, and you're the first person again, that the Defense Ministry acknowledged in a document showing on a new section of the website since uh, a period for a period of time uh, that the, uh, the intrusion took place. But two days later, uh, it was put up to the Ministry of Defense website, and the page was missing. Uh, is it because uh, of the Prime Minister's statements that was there of the n neither Chinese soldiers uh, were there in the territory nor they occupy any of the Indian territory? Uh, or was it of any other factors? What was the reason for this sudden change of uh, statement from the Defence Ministry? Well, uh, Rasnadeep, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what happened. Uh, from the beginning of this uh, intrusion, the government has been trying to underplay it uh, in the hope, I understand. Uh, the, the Chinese will at some stage say that we have made our point, now let's go back to our side of the line of actual control and everything will go back to normal and, you know, the government won't have to, have to admit that it lost Indian territory to the Chinese. Uh, but that, that's a non-sustainable uh, strategy as, as far as I can see because the Chinese are not up sticking and leaving and going back to their own side of the territory. So you have a large number of individuals when a government is trying to hide a situation or to sort of uh, give false information or misleading information about the situation, uh, it always ends up getting caught in its own web of lies. You know, uh, these conflicting statements that they're giving or, and there are a large number of people who give statements from the, uh, from the government side, they start contradicting one another. And this was a classic example of such a case where the Prime Minister had been misleadingly asked by somebody uh, in his own staff to say that there have not been any intrusions into Indian territory, no, no soldiers have uh, come into this territory. And as a result of that, uh, it sort of uh, it was it was contradicted by the defense ministry statement that was put out. Uh, the defense ministry, having got uh, sort of a rocket from the from the prime minister's office, then withdrew that statement from its website. So this is uh, this is uh, sort of a, a situation in which journalism always thrives, where different departments of the of the government are putting out different uh, sort of pieces of information and different sort of contradictory statements. Uh, that's how a good research journalist, a research based journalist can pick up these mistakes and errors and point them out in his writing. So, so military channels are open. The recent, the recent visit of Raksha Mantri to Moscow in the SCO summit also involved a bilateral meeting with the Chinese counterpart. Are these mechanisms enough to contain the constant dispute with China or do, you, do we need another uh, solution to it? For example, we are having commander level conversations between the Indian and Chinese troops. So what are we expecting from the current dialogue between the Chinese and the Indian defense ministers? Uh, well, the, the bottom line is that the entire bilateral framework that has maintained peace on the border since the 1993 agreement uh, has completely broken down. Now, there are five major agreements that keep the peace on the border. The Border Peace and Tranquility Agreement of 1993, the Conference Building Measures of, 2000, of uh, 1996. Uh, there's a set of standard operating procedures for the border 
uh, which was negotiated in 2005. Uh, and then there's the border defense mechanism and the working framework of 2012 and 2013. Uh, but you can have endless agreements and you can have newer and newer agreements. But when one side is bent on changing the status quo or uh, sort of improving its position on the border, as China clearly is, then all the treaties and agreements in the world cannot uh, keep the peace. What you need is uh, sort of a benign intent. Uh, and I think that the Chinese, as evidence from the fact that they are un unwilling to, uh, to exchange maps with their mutual perceptions of the LAC marked on it, uh, make it clear that the Chinese want to retain freedom of action on the line of actual control. Uh, and as long as one side is changing the status quo uh, and the other side is responding, uh, another fresh agreement, as you're uh, suggesting that uh, India might like to negotiate, is not going to change some, uh, something substantially because the, the sort of malintent of the Chinese side continues to be there. So I think India needs to do something to incentivize China to change its behavior. Uh, and that is what we really need, not just another framework agreement. Yeah. So, sir, uh, with this core commander uh, level talks being going on, we have seen, uh, if we give the timeline, that the first uh, the general, uh, the lieutenant general talks around one that happened on June 6th. And on June 15, we have seen the clash at Galwan Valley. On 22nd June, we have seen the second round of talks. And 24th, we have seen uh, China increasing position at finger four. On June 30, we have seen the same talks. And we have seen in July 2, mobilization in West Bank or, uh, 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 or the DBO, uh, we have seen that entire uh, fresh mobilization. Same with July uh, 7, 14 talks and uh, consequently July 17 uh, mobilization. So in August too as well, sir, the fifth round of talks happened, and yet China refuses to discuss about Pangong So. And with all this, we have another level of talks, but uh, we have we seen this channel of this conversation at core commander level and general level talks. And we have tried to solve it uh, with dialogue for a long period of time, but we have seen the Chinese not respecting the, uh, the, the dialogues that happening with India. Uh, what is India's option left right now? Do you think India still should go for dialogues with China at this point in time? And also just add to one small thing with the thing that last said. Uh, we have seen the statement from uh, the Defense Ministry today. And we have seen these four words, trust, non-aggression, respect for international rules and peaceful resolution of differences. And he's telling that these are the four elements that are needed for maintaining the peace and security. Is he taking a soft tone and going on the back foot and still asking for diplomacy rather than uh, increasing uh, the defense side of the story? Well, as I just mentioned just now, uh, one can keep having negotiations, but if the intent of the other side is to maintain its sort of uh, the positions it has gained, to continue to keep the pressure on India, to keep India tied up on the line of actual control, uh, to not return, to not adhere to the framework agreements that have been signed over the over the years, uh, then what use is it having dialogue between core commanders and so on and so forth? The dialogue only works when both sides have an intent to uh, to sort of uh, improve the situation uh, and to pull back troops in this particular case. But China clearly does not have that intent. So in my particular opinion, it is time for India to spice up its dialogue uh, sort of process and its bargaining position by capturing key territory, disputed points, uh, by uh, launching its own sort of uh, limited military actions along the line of actual control, and by incentivizing China to, to sort of uh, reach some kind of settlement, uh, which will only happen when China sees that it has to pay a cost for what it is doing. Right now, India is not imposing any cost, uh, and that is sort of leaving it in a bargaining position where it does not have enough chips on the table. So, uh, in, in that case, sir, is there, do, we, do we hold any sort of leverage in this whole conflict situation? Uh, a leverage which can possibly compel China to pursue a mutual de-escalation? De 
Yes, we do hold leverage. The Indian Army is a strong, powerful army. Uh, it's one of the world's sort of top five armies. It, this is not a small country that China is toying with, the way it toys with countries in South China Sea. Uh, India and the Indian Army have clear options. They have clear resources devoted to those options. Uh, they have planned those options, rehearsed those options. Uh, they have a strike force. They have armored brigades uh, that are geared, sort of tasked and geared and equipped and positioned for uh, eventualities like this. Uh, and as I mentioned, India needs to exercise a partial military option in order to incentivize the Chinese to come to the table with serious intent. So, sir, in, in that case, we, uh, indeed, we are a very strong army. So, uh, replicating the China, Chinese model of gaining territory, can the Indian side do the same, considering that we have a very high, uh, a very high performance in high altitude warfare? Can we replicate China's model of gaining territory elsewhere alongside the LSE, and then again have China to sit on the table and have a conversation about resolving the dispute? Yes, precisely. That's just what I said just now. Okay. So, sir, uh, uh, we have seen uh, in the last uh, few hours that uh, the Indian Army extended a helping hand to uh, three Chinese citizens who lost their way in the plateau of North Sikkim. And a recent news comes in. Arunachal Pradesh uh, sent, uh, the cops sent probe reports of five kidnapped uh, men by Chinese Army. Uh, so, what's this entire thing happening with citizens uh, being involved in the entire conflict? Well, there are, uh, as you know, there are border villages, there are citizens that live in the conflict zone, whether there's, uh, we talk whether you're talking about the line of control with Pakistan or the line of actual control with China. And there are citizens who sort of run, live and run their day-to-day -day lives in the middle of all this conflict. Now, they sometimes get caught up in uh, situations like this. They stray accidentally across the border. Maybe some of somebody is chasing his cow that has run away and, you know, uh, accidentally crosses the border. There are all kinds of situations that these civilians can find themselves in. Uh, but this should not be confused with the larger strategic and operational dimensions of the confrontation that is going on with India and China. Uh, these are sort of day-to-day -day events that are handled by border control mechanisms, uh, by flag meetings, by sort of exchanges that take place on the border between the two armies. Uh, these should not be confused with uh, the, the sort of the larger intrusions and the counter action that the Indian Army could perhaps be taking uh, or is preparing to take. Uh, these are two different things entirely. So I would not see the uh, sort of uh, straying of, uh, of, uh, of citizens in uh, North Sikkim, uh, the Chinese citizens who have been helped by the Indian Army there, as anything to do with the confrontation that we are now seeing unfolding before I. Okay, so sir, uh, uh, we have uh, like with the entire thing that's happening, and you have spoken about this before, uh, with. The entire Indian military confined to blocking further ingress. Uh, it's uh, it's a point in about defensive mode rather than evicting the PLA from its territory it has captured. Uh, do you think we are putting little pressure in Beijing to actually uh, sit on the table or actually restore the status quo, Andy? Uh, yes, that's what I will, we just discussed a short while ago. India needs to put more incentives before Beijing to create more incentives. Uh, it needs to do this by limited military action of its own, occupation of unoccupied heights and so on, uh, to incentivize China to come to the table and discuss this seriously. Uh, you know, in the current circumstances where China is in control of Indian territory and Indian ha India has no control over any Chinese territory and is essentially in a defensive blocking uh, sort of deployment, uh, we don't have enough cards on the table, enough chips on the table, I should say, uh, to be able to negotiate for this Okay. Uh, so, um, we have seen over the few year, uh, past few months that a lot of uh, people in the diploma, uh, diplomatic segment have suggested that uh, India should bring the, uh, the card of the Hong, the Hong Kong card or use the Taiwan, the Taiwan card. 
Uh, do you think this could have been a possible uh, card that India could play against the Chinese at this point of time, against the global community, uh, in front of the global community at this point of time? Uh, well, well, India has been uh, sort of reacting in a very accepting manner to a large number of Chinese provocations you know, over the past uh, five or six years. Uh, whether it is the issue of China's obstruction of India's entry into the nuclear suppliers group, whether it's China's technical block which is placed on the designation of Masood Azhar as a global terrorist, whether it is uh, China's sort of entry into the China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, into disputed territory that India claims. Uh, on, on all these occasions and on all these instances, the Indian side has sort of sat very quietly and been very accepting of Chinese sort of uh, obstructionism and uh, sort of the uh, obstreperousness, I should say. Uh, so, uh, sort of India had the opportunities and had the incentives all along to criticize China on its handling of the COVID crisis or on its handling of the Hong Kong protests or its sort of aggression and change of uh, designation in, in the Taiwan uh, sort of uh, relationship. Uh, but India has not chosen to do it. For some reason, Delhi has been very uh, sort of mild in its reaction to Chinese uh, sort of provocation and Chinese goading. So, uh, you know, it, it should not have been so mild uh, because it's given China the impression that India doesn't have the stomach for a fight, that India can be pushed over. Uh, and so, you know, my answer to your question really is that while India could not get up and cannot get up and say something as provocative as Taiwan should be independent or an independent country or Hong Kong should be independent or Tibet should be independent, there are ways of using these levers to exert pressure on uh, the Chinese decision makers, but India has failed to do that. So, sir, one small comment that I want to get from you before we move on to the next part is that do you think the presence of a, a prime minister like Mr. Modi, who believes in an aggressive policy, when uh, anything happens on with Pakistan, he prefers a surgical strike, uh, it would have been uh, Xi Jinping would have known this very well that if something happens with China, India has always resisted uh, facing China uh, face to face. Uh, Mr. Modi will, uh, if, will only use an uh, aggressive move rather than going on the defensive front using that China, uh, using either the Hong Kong card or the Taiwan card, uh, had actually leverage of have, uh, doing this intrusion at this point of time under this regime. Oh, well, uh, China has seen very clearly that uh, the government and Mr. Modi in particular uh, are more interested in the domestic political audience in India uh, than they are in uh, sort of in the larger geopolitical and geostrategic issues there around the border where no voters live. Uh, so I would say that China has understood well that if it can occupy Indian territory uh, and then give a certain element of deniability to Mr. Modi, uh, his government uh, and he himself are more than likely to echo the Chinese view that they have not occupied Indian territory. So you had this completely ludicrous situation where the Indian Prime Minister was endorsing the Chinese contention that their soldiers are not in occupation of Indian territory and that, that they are only in Chinese territory. Uh, it essentially cedes Indian territory to China without a fight. Uh, if, essentially, if uh, China is occupying the Galwan Valley, let's say, uh, and they say we are not in Indian territory, we are only in Chinese territory, and the Prime Minister gets up and says that, yes, indeed, there has been no intrusion, then what he's really saying is that the Galwan Valley belongs to China, because the, the, uh, the Chinese soldiers who are there are in their own territory. So you have this ridiculous situation where domestic politics is causing India to, and India's leaders and decision makers and policy makers to take positions that are in sync with the Chinese national interest rather than the Indian national interest. And that's an extremely dangerous position to be. I think China has understood this well. 
Xi Jinping has understood what uh, the dynamics of uh, dealing with Mr. Modi are. And uh, sadly, India is the loser here. So, uh, recently, uh, our Chief of Army Staff General Narwani, he made a visit to the to, to Ladakh in the Eastern Frontier. And uh, constantly, we have heard statement from the CDS as well that we are ready for a full-fledged uh, conflict with China. And also that General Narwane, he, he suggested, he assured the country that the morale of the troops are very high and we are ready to combat any challenges as such. So in that particular spirit, uh, can you tell us about the readiness of levels of the Indian military? Is the Indian military ready for the war with the Chinese in that particular sense? Oh, well, first of all, nobody has said that we are ready for a full-fledged war with uh, China. What uh, the chief of defense staff said was that the military option is on the table. It has not been removed from the table. Uh, and that essentially means that uh, if no other means are sort of uh, is successful in achieving Indian ends, uh, we could use military force, uh, a limited calibrated military force, as uh, sort of any military officer will tell you, in order to put greater pressure on the Chinese. Uh, I think that the Indian Army is very capable of doing that. The Indian military, I should say, because the Air Force and the Navy will play their roles as well. Uh, I think that there is, there are several ways, there are several options, and these options have all been planned and rehearsed and uh, sort of uh, validated uh, for putting military pressure on, on China. Uh, so, to answer your question, uh, we don't have to be ready for a full-fledged war with China. China itself will be sort of uh, chary about uh, imposing a full-fledged war on India. These are two nuclear powers. India has a nuclear deterrent uh, in place to hold off China if nothing else works. So it will, is more, it will sort of more likely be about uh, imposing low-grade costs on each other rather than going in for a full-fledged war. And for that, I think the Indian military is more than ready. So, sir, the sense of nationalism that we see around the whole Indochina conflict in India is is uh, like it's is very is ultimate in that sense. And the same sense of nationalism with the Indochina conflict is never witnessed in China as such. So, what exactly is the role of the media here in cultivating those thoughts and you know? lighting up the fire in that particular manner? Well, the, the media certainly has its role, uh, but it has to be said that in a totalitarian state like China, the media is far more under control and far more likely to throw the government line than in democratic India. So in uh, sort of, uh, uh, in a situation like like Doklam, for example, where China wanted to inflame the situation and wanted to pretend that there was pressure on the decision makers to take a hard line, uh, it inflamed the media and it ordered the media to, to sort of uh, take a hard line stance against India and be very critical about so-called Indian expansionism. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, you know, China has achieved its aim. It, it does not want to complicate the situation or the narrative for itself uh, by putting a sort of a, a hyper-nationalist public also being for blood uh, for India. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question that you're asking is about the role of the media. But it, the, the role of the media in the Chinese case is defined by the Chinese state. Whereas in the Indian case, there are, there are elements of the media that are absolutely under control of the government. Uh, I should not say uh, under control of the government, but voluntarily towing the government line. And there's a sort of large section of independent media that will report the truth as it believes uh, it to be. So, sir, uh, you have uh, written about uh, these, uh, a blog about the Special Frontier Force and uh, about his taking his first casualty in Ladakh institution and uh, the coffin of the company leader, uh, Mr. Of Tenzin, uh, of the Special Frontier Force. And we have seen the Chinese uh, releasing, uh, after that, a press release. 
and we have seen before as well of china's uh, like uh, the how china reacts whenever a tibetan actually like speaks or in the uses tibetan force or in the uses a special uh, of whether it any in form any format in 2018 for example when dalai lama went to arunachal pradesh which uh, china considers south tibet uh, we have seen how china reacted to it uh, with this entire news coming up do you think it was the right time for india and or do you think any more reaction come will come from china with this entire thing uh well uh, to to sort of uh, agree first with your observation uh, that china is extremely sensitive to tibetan uh, unrest and tibetan uprising and tibetan separatism and so on uh, and to that extent it will be extremely uh, sort of uh, uh, what should i say provoke uh, by uh, any use of the special frontier force Uh, but the special frontier force is not a, a, a great secret uh, it's a secret only for the indian public the chinese know very well about the special frontier force uh, they have protested to india in uh, sort of official dialogues and so on uh, about the use of this so called tibetan separatist militia uh, so to that extent i was educating the indian public rather than the chinese decision maker uh, the second thing is that you know uh, all these forces like your nuclear deterrent are deterrent forces and a deterrent force only acts as a deterrent when the other side knows about it and is reminded about it so to that extent uh, you know uh, the role of the media in reporting certain uh, issues uh, such as nuclear deployment or nuclear capability or the development of a new weapon Uh, or the firing of a new long-range missile. This is all part of deterrent signaling, uh, and the role of media in deterrent signaling is well established. Uh, if there, if nothing gets reported, there is no deterrence, because nobody gets to know about that particular deterrent force. So, to that extent, I have no regrets for doing the story about the special frontier force. Uh, I think that it's a fantastic militia that is doing a great job, uh, and they deserve their place in the sun. Uh, they were extremely happy, incidentally, uh, by the by the sort of the highlighting of their role uh, in this particular operation, uh, and I think they deserve their place in the sun. Yeah. So, sir, uh, the last point that I want to make on the special twenty forces: Do you think this uh, somewhat reflects India's seriousness? in trying to deal with the chinese intuition at this point that india can go at any length uh, with the deployment of special uh, frontier force uh, yes uh, the india uh, sort of india has not uh, deployed the special frontier force from a non deployment situation uh, there were already and there are at any given time uh, a couple of battalions of the special frontier force deployed ab initio in uh, in ladakh and in the siachen glacier sector uh, where high altitude abilities uh, really count for something so uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, in some way their use in operations by india does uh, sort of uh, reflect on indian seriousness and the fact that india is you know we're sending a tacit warning to china that uh, you know we have the ability to stir up trouble in your in your sort of sensitive spots uh, but uh, it is to be remembered that uh, this is not by any means the first time that the special frontier force has appeared on the border uh, before china they are already deployed there and they function there and have been doing that for many years so i have uh, a couple of more questions on the navy part uh, so sir uh, the first is a lot of when we asked uh, people to send the questions on indo china a lot of people sent on the string of pearls on the indian navy part uh, and what india is actually doing though it's an offbeat topic i want to ask you uh, of india's approach to chinese foreign policy on string of pearls we have seen india investing in recent in countries like the uh, like uzbekistan uh, kazakhstan and mongolia and it's all surrounding china and do you think it's for the first time india is taking a more reactive policy to china string of pearls than an operative one and is it the right policy to actually tackle the chinese debt trap policy because we have seen uh, 
a Pakistan port, a now Sri Lankan port under Chinese, is it the right po- uh, way to go forward for India? Oh, well, uh, first of all, you know, when it comes to uh, extending your influence in the backyard of a potential adversary, uh, no, every sort of major power tries to do that. Uh, and this is uh, sort of enshrined in Indian strategic thinking from the time of Chanakya and his uh, theory of concentric circles. Uh, just as for China, it has been enshrined in strategic thinking from the days of Sun Tzu. Uh, so I don't think that there is uh, sort of anything very new that is going on here. Uh, and just to, to sort of... Uh, reassure the people who are very worried about this string of pearls. Uh, you know, pearls like uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and Pakistan and so on uh, are on the one hand and then on the other hand if you start looking at India's pearls, uh, they are countries like Japan and Australia and the United States and Singapore uh, India's pearls are a lot bigger and a lot more valuable uh, than China's pearls. Uh, and in any case, to, to quote Shivshankar Menon, who said this at a book release in Delhi some years ago, uh, a string of pearls is not a very good murder weapon. <laughs> but uh, do you think uh, will India would like to take help from uh, the United States at this point of time if offered? Mr. Donald oh, yes, Trump today uh, as well uh, pointed it out that he is ready to mediate again the Indochina issue. There was a statement, oh, I think, a statement uh, from I the think White House saying that. Sir, we saying lost. what? Sir, we uh, lost. Uh, no, it's fine. Uh, so uh, the sta- there was a statement, as usual, from the White House claiming that he's ready to mediate and find a solution if there's needed between India and China. Oh, well. Uh, the United States has uh, offered uh, certainly uh, five or six times since this crisis began. Uh, to my certain knowledge, it has offered uh, sort of assistance to the Indian side. Mediation is a different issue. Huh? We, are, we are not talking about mediation. I am talking about clear assistance to the Indian side in handling the Chinese uh, sort of inclusion. Uh, India has chosen not to accept uh, there is a feeling amongst policymakers that India must handle its own problems itself. Uh, it's part of being a big boy, uh, rather than uh, you know looking over your shoulder for help at the first sign of difficulty. So uh, I don't think the, the Indian side is likely to uh, accept any U.S. assistance. Uh, Offers maybe from Trump, uh, nobody really takes those seriously. You know. Uh, a person who sort of uh, makes all his serious offers by tweeting at 2 a.m. is not likely to be taken seriously by the other side. Uh, we are also, it has to be remembered, facing a situation where there could be a change of administration in the United States. It's pretty much touch and go. Is it going to be Trump for a second term or is it going to be Biden? And nobody knows what Biden's China policy is going to be. Is it going to be an attempt to mend fences with China, in which case India will find itself left out in the cold once again? So uh, I would say that India is rightly uh, sort of chary about accepting uh, assistance from the United States at this point in time, both because it wants to prove its own ability to handle a crisis as well as from the point of view of the reliability of the offer that is being made. So, uh, so five days before we have seen this, uh, like uh, all the news channels reporting this and this coming to the front of uh, Indian Navy sending uh, warships or uh, deploying warships to the South China Sea. What's the significance of that? Uh, how does it? Ha- uh, how how to, how do you see this? Fantastic. Uh, It's a very significant statement because it reveals the utter incompetence of the journalists who reported this. Uh, Mm -hmm. India's uh, sort of deployment of warships to the uh, South China Sea has been a long-standing feature of its uh, sort of mission-based deployment, as it calls it. Uh, There are always, there have been for years and for decades Indian warships going to the South China Sea. Indian submarines sort of going on patrol to the South China Sea. 
this is nothing new at all uh, and it's part of the indian navy's uh, sort of latest profile of mission bay based deployment it has to be understood that the high seas are not anybody's property or domain uh, the high seas are international waters uh, there is freedom of navigation in all these areas and if china tries to impede an indian warship in the south china sea it will be in violation of the un convention on the laws of the seas so this is nothing new uh, this is just one of those uh, stories that was planted by the government uh, and picked up by gullible journalists uh, it doesn't really mean anything yeah so it's in a right note that we're going to end with this question that a lot of people asked from the audience and wants to know uh since we are in a state that any news uh, planted by the government you're telling that is being uh, used as a bait or as a nationalism nationalism bait to con- persuade the audience that everything is going fine uh how to be a defense journalist in this present modi's india how to report properly and what is it involved to be a defense journalist in india at this point of time and last thing do you think we need more institution that can train people for this field because you have been in the army before and you came so you had the field knowledge but what if people who are not in have been trained as in, in the well we not in a veteran wants to be a journalist a defense journalist well i think that uh, you know your question while it relates to defense journalism is actually a much larger question and yeah, i will i will try and uh, expand it uh, and then deal with it in the larger context that uh, that it really exists in which is that how important is it for journalists to be specialists in the field in which they report whether it is defense whether it is petroleum whether it is healthcare whether it is education whether it is agriculture and farming uh if you have journalists that are just picked up and switched from beat to beat uh, and remain non specialists in the the core areas in which they are reporting uh i think that we have a a problem you know you every journalist in my opinion must have a core area of specialization must work towards developing that specialization uh, and must sort of equip himself or herself uh to be able to report authoritatively on the subject uh, on which they are doing uh, and certainly uh, at least as authoritatively as the people who are trying to feed information relating to that field uh, what i'm saying is that if somebody is a, a defense journalist is going to a joint secretary in the ministry of defense uh, and getting a, sort of a, a statement from him or uh, in many cases a plant uh, planted statement the journalist must be at least in a position to judge uh, whether that statement has any holes in it what are those holes uh, and to counter question before actually going and printing uh, sort of that news uh, the problem is that we don't have this tradition of specialist and specialization uh, it would be in my sort of one plea to journalists uh, in the future that equip yourself for your role make sure that you are an expert in your field uh, and you will then be able to report authoritatively and without fear or favor uh, and you will not be dependent on government officials and beholden to them yeah i was saying so that we need why, a why, why do you need you could need a master class from me you can't uh, sort of equip yourself for defense journalism in one master class uh, you have to spend years learning the subject developing experience uh, not just for defense journalism i would say for for a field which is far more important for example agriculture and farming uh, you have to you know there are people like k sainath who have spent years and years and become almost uh, you know steeped in the in the culture and law and uh, technicalities of that so that that's what is needed not just uh, one or two classes from one or two people who are uh, older in that field uh, that's only going to provide a limited context but it's eventually in your own hands as a journalist but i think being an ex serviceman makes a lot of difference and then being a journalist uh, but i 
So, sir, on that note, we like to end the conversation, but with a small task uh, that we generally do with all our guests. Uh, so, since most of our viewers are students, and since you mentioned the importance of studying, any five books that you would like to recommend to our student to all the students who are watching this? Uh, five books that are uh, that would uh, sort of uh, cover defense journalism. uh if they want to because sir uh, i think they are actually interested in defense journalism because once we doing the show uh, all the comments that we got is we actually did a couple of shows in china and the other question is bring ajay shukla so i think uh, they want to know from your mouth the horse's mouth what books they should read in defense journalism well it's uh, uh, i think that five books is uh, far too little and will not really uh, sort of uh, uh cover the field adequately but uh, the first thing that you need is a technical history of uh, sort of uh, of uh, the field uh, because technology really works in defense to the extent that it works in few other fields so the the, the changes in technology that have uh, come up uh, over the years and so on uh, those are stuff that has to be studied through many books not just five books but uh, let me let me sort of uh, recommend firstly uh, uh, sort of a, a very strong grounding in history uh, that is extremely important for defense journalists uh, second uh, uh, i would recommend a book called makers of modern strategy uh, which is an edited volume but uh, so sort it of has many excellent essays in it that cover a wide range of uh, uh, sort of parts of journalism uh, then there's the eternal bible of uh, of uh, defense uh, and warfare which is on war by karl von clausewitz uh, that's uh, that's the central reading uh, then there would be uh, i would say uh, a sort of uh, A, a grounding that you need to have in uh, India's uh, sort of uh, post-independence uh, military profiles and campaigns. Uh, on that, I can recommend uh, like easily twenty books uh, on themselves. So you know, believe me, what I'm really saying is that I'm not going to let you get away with the idea that five books are good and. <laughs> will we would need to read a lot more than five books yeah on uh, that too sir thank you so much sir for taking your time uh, and i know so 
it's you have a massive schedule a very busy schedule but thank you so much sir for taking your time out and speaking to us it means a lot to actually hear from you who has bring up the entire story in the, in the front and this has been a really great experience speaking to you well i am i'm very pleased to interact with the young audience and i hope all of you go on to do great and wonderful reporting and i'm sure i'll be sort of reading about you in the day thank you yeah.